All right. This is your Gaza War Sit Rep Day 171. And I don't know if I can exactly say there's no end in sight. There's something in sight. It might be a mirage. We're going to have to talk about the UN Security Council resolution brought by Algeria, which the United States did not veto. At this point, you already know that probably that it passed 14 to 0 with an abstention from the United States. What is the meaning of this? Uh, we've been puzzling over it all day. And at first I thought um, it's theater like all the other previous ceasefire resolutions. Then I saw that Hamas had welcomed it. So, I mean, oh, actually, no, that's not true. The first thing I did was I thought, okay, theater, like everything else, Israel will ignore it. But then I thought, let's read the text. I read the text and the text said, uh, we demand a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire. And we demand the, re the un immediate and unconditional release of all the hostages. So I thought, ah, I see the trick here. This is a linkage. This is the same kind of thing that the U.S. had tried to pass that was vetoed, but somehow the Security Council let this one through. But apparently there's no linkage. I guess the word and is not a conditioning word in the text. So the text says we call for this and we call for that. So Hamas welcomed it and Hamas said we are very happy if Israel is forced to do this uh, and we're ready to do the prisoner exchange. So they didn't, they seem to have ignored the part about the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages and just taken the part about the ceasefire. Now, I thought that maybe the, then I thought that the call for an immediate and unconditional release of the hostages was giving Israel some kind of out. Like they were saying, well, they Hamas didn't do their hostage um, release, so we don't have to do our the ceasefire. Then I thought, then I thought, why did the U.S. veto this? I mean, why didn't why didn't the U.S. veto this? And then we saw, I don't know if you saw this, but the United States then declared that the resolution was non-binding. Security Council resolutions are binding. You can't just declare them non-binding after the fact. If you didn't want it to be binding, you should have vetoed it. So then I just thought, why didn't the Americans veto this one? Why didn't they veto this one? Was it because it calls for the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages? No. They would they they had had their their version of it vetoed. This is not their version. This was a version that was willing the Russians and Chinese were willing to pass without vetoing. Why didn't they veto it? And that the fact that they didn't veto it tells me that like some of the other things, this is not unfolding. I had to come to the conclusion that this is not unfolding the way Israel wants. This, I do not think, is what Israel wanted. You probably saw the news that Netanyahu threatened not to come to America on a delegation if the Americans didn't veto, and then they didn't veto, and so he, now he has to follow through and say, we're not coming. So he's punishing the United States by not coming to the United States. It's a curious kind of punishment, but it's punishment nonetheless. And I'm sure the Americans are very sad about it. And so what's going on? Why didn't they veto it? It could be orchestrated. It could all be orchestrated, but if it's being orchestrated, then to what end? What what do they get out of letting the Security Council pass a resolution for a ceasefire? I I have to think. I mean, if here's one here's one possibility of why it might be orchestrated. It might be orchestrated because Israel can't take the military pressure anymore or the costs. One little news item I saw in terms of the costs that was interesting to me 
uh, I'm just going to try to find it, is some someone calculated on al Mayadeen English. I saw this little figure. Wages for a single Israeli occupation soldier cost the government a whopping $7,500 to $17,000 a month, a report from the Israeli Treasury has revealed. So are these the regulars? Are these the reserves, the hundreds of thousands of reserves? If it's 100,000, if it's 100,000 that are on reserve and they're each getting 10,000 a month, if they're if 100,000 are mobilized and they're getting 100 and they're getting 10,000 a month, what are we talking here? A hundred million, a billion, a billion dollar wage bill a month? Is that is that reasonable? A billion dollars a month in wages for the soldiers, which means six billion and counting? And are the Americans paying for this? Probably. Are they raising this from taxes, which they're charging to people who aren't working because they're all reserved and they're in the army? Because they're all mobilized to be in the army? This is a substantial Israeli cost. This is a substantial economic problem, especially when you consider the casualties that they're taking, the permanent disability that these soldiers are ending up in. And I mean, what they're turning themselves into even when they're doing the occupation but that's uh, those are those costs will come due in um in time i suppose so maybe the costs are getting high and they are looking to be forced to a ceasefire after all in that case that would make sense for this to be orchestrated in terms of well, you guys know probably by now that i'm not a big believer in the reality of a Republican Democrat split. I don't really believe, I believe that whenever it matters and when foreign policy and, and imperialism is a area where it matters, I believe that they are willing to come together. They are willing to make sacrifices of their own team. They're willing to come in second if it means protecting imperial interests first, protecting US standing, US ability to continue to drain the resources of the global south, the Western ability to drain the global, the resources of the global south. So that's true of France, Germany, Britain, Canada. They're willing to make sacrifices to each other. They're willing to make sacrifices within the parties in those countries. They're willing to, like I said, lose elections. So I, none of this, this has never been all that convincing to me, the idea that Biden is really upset that he's going to lose an election. Like I've always said, who knows whether Biden is even in there. And a lot of the foreign policy people switch teams. They, they, the neocons work for both Republican and Democratic administrations. So I'm not a big believer in the electoral theory that Biden's afraid of losing the election, and that's why there's a shift. I don't think so. But core interests being at stake, that's another story. And Israel, if Israel's losing, Israel's losing. And there's no there's no election that can make Israel start winning a military conflict that Israel is losing. There's no way to, you can print money, but you can't print material. You can't print equipment. You can't get soldiers into the field to replace the ones that are, that have either lost their minds or have become some kind of reavers or, or um, that have died in the field. So on the, on the other hand, so to just to just to throw a wrench into this, I saw on uh, a liberal commentator on his uh, Twitter. He retweeted a Israeli commentator, and it was Donald Trump to an Israeli media outlet saying, "You have to end your war. You have to do it. We have to reach peace. 
we cannot allow this to continue. Israel has to be very careful because you lose a lot of the world. You are losing a lot of support. So Trump talking about the importance of keeping the world, the Republican alternative, tilting Republican, tilting right wing has been Israel's plan for maintaining support in the West. So realizing that liberals were defecting from Israel, they opted to go for the right and go right. And that seems to have been successful. And the liberals at, at the elite level, the liberal party in Canada, the left part, the NDP in Canada, they're all pro-Israel anyway. So it's the Green Party in Canada uh, and the Democrats and Republicans and across the board in Western countries, Labour in the UK. So there's no, there hasn't been a political cost for Israel in, in becoming illiberal. It hasn't cost them their liberal support, but the, the flip side seems to be that there are conservatives that are just either defecting from Israel or like Trump, they're not defecting from Israel. Trump has said many times that he's going to be with Israel forever, but he's saying that's enough now. And he's publicly saying that's enough now. The Americans did not veto the resolution. So something is shaking, creaking at the internet in at the international level. Just one other quote from a Twitter that I found today that I, I or yesterday that I really identified with Amro Ali. I don't know anything about this account, but it says, I don't think the West gets it, and I'm not sure they ever will. The social contract has unraveled. Things will not be the same anymore. You don't become an active accomplice to genocide and shocking horrors, then expect a return to business as usual. And Gaza has changed everything. And I think that's right. I, I don't think we're going to know, like I've mentioned this many times before, I don't think the consequences are going to be felt in the short term, but I sure think that this is going to be transformational in terms of the Western countries, societies. We realize that our leaders are absolutely genocidal with no limits. No, they don't care about the truth. They're utterly committed to lying to us. They despise us. They think we're idiots and they are willing to do anything to con help Israel continue murdering um, children, destroying hospitals, and they'll just pretend they don't know. And, and now rape too. They're willing to repeat any lies. They're willing to pretend they don't see evidence. They're willing to make up fake evidence. This is not, these are not people who can lead a society anymore. These are not people who can gain the trust of a society. And maybe we talked about this on Tanky Therapy yesterday. Maybe it's always been the case. Maybe there are historical precedents for this, but the, the disgust and disillusionment with Western leaders, Western culture for and everything that they've done to enable and facilitate and participate in this genocide it's going to have reverberations it's exposed liberalism for a hollow shell it's uh, exposed it as a racially hierarchical system that its proponents don't really believe in and that's going to be far-reaching but not not now um in terms of someone who wrote about that, the moon of Alabama, uh, I think is it's like a German background, um, but they do military analysis. I'm sure you've, you've probably, you're probably aware of moon of Alabama, but they, they had an article today called deterrence by savagery that caught my eye. And they said, as they lose the ability to, as they lose deterrence in terms of conventional weapons or nuclear weapons, financial power 
having lost its two main sources of power. Let's see, what are the two main sources? Rules-based order, hypersonic weapons, organized violence. It's two main sources being, I think he's trying to say international law, value, the superiority of its ideas, superiority of organized violence. So soft power, hard power. So hard power, it's not on top and international law has been exposed as something the West doesn't really care about. Legitimacy is not something they care about. Being liked is not something they care about. Being respected, having a reputation for telling the truth, having a reputation for being against genocide. None of those things are things they care about. So they've lost these two sources of power. So now the rules-based order is a soft power instrument and hard power superiority. The West is in need of a new instrument of deterrence. And that is utter savagery. The war on Gaza is a demonstration that the West is willing to cross all lines, discard any nuance of humanity, commit genocide, that it will do everything to prevent international organizations to intervene against this, eliminate everyone and everything that resists it. Those nations who commit themselves to multipolarity should steal themselves for what, be, what might be visited on them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that could be, that could be the idea that certainly fits with what we know of Israel. And as Mikey in Tanky Therapy yesterday said, he said, everything that they're doing is to try to restore the terror that they had um, felt like they held over the Palestinians before October 7th. And so this whole reaction, this whole genocidal reaction is to try to push them back into that state of fear and um the whole west is participating in that it's important to everybody that the palestinians go back to being bullied successfully and the mechanism to do it is what moon of alabama is calling savagery that's one of the weakest weapons though and i think as as that assessment of savagery as the main tool of deterrence is probably a good way for us to segue to our reports from the fronts. And I want to show you a map. It's an interesting map we have. It's been going around today. And it is of... And remember, in terms of guerrilla war, we, we kind of had this from the beginning. We said this, trying trying to, the idea of the notion of cutting Gaza in half and controlling this road or territorial control. It doesn't really make sense. It's not a good strategy when you think, when you consider that there's a tunnel network under here and when you consider that guerrilla warfare is opportunistic in terms of when the Israelis settle into an area is precisely when you can actually hit them in Gaza. You can't actually go to war with Israeli infantry if those infantry are sitting back and they're bombarding you from the air. So even this map, which is dark gray is current Israeli control, light gray is the areas where they were and then they've withdrawn. They control these parts and then they get hit and hit and hit and hit and then they withdraw and then we repeat that process. And it this has been the war for the past six months, and it's gonna, there's no sign of it stopping at all. And this is just, there's every reason to think that this is how it's gonna keep going. Now, one of the places where the Israelis have decided that they are gonna really throw down at great cost to themselves is Al-Shifa Hospital, their return to Al-Shifa Hospital, which we've been covering in sit reps for more than a week now. And again, many, many field reports of fighting. So we're hearing field reports from inside the hospital of civilians about women being raped and murdered in front of their families, in front of staff and patients, 
the agents not allowing the family to close their eyes. So there's abundant evidence, testimonies, unlike the claims of October 7th rapes, there are actual, there's actual evidence in this case. And obviously nobody's talking about it in the mainstream media that was so keen to talk about it in the context of October 7th. So what's happening to those forces as they're com as they're conducting this campaign of destruction of the hospital, murder, field executions, murder of surrendered people, murder of medical personnel, hundreds of them now, rapes, murders, massacres of children, as they're doing this, as they're setting up casually around the neighborhoods, setting up in buildings, setting up in windows to snipe, to try to maintain control over the hospital in the area, they are coming under fire from the resistance. Israeli mil military vehicles, this is a field reports from two days ago, from March 23rd, Qassam brigades hit an Israeli military vehicle with a Yassin 105 in the vicinity of Al-Shifa, targeted a group of occupation soldiers holed up inside a building with a TBG, shelled invading forces around Al-Shifa hospital with mortar shells, targeted an APC with Yassin 105 rockets south of Al-Shifa in Gaza City, targeted three Merkava tanks with the Shawath explosive and Yassin 105 causing casualties in Gaza City, Al-Aqsa martyrs brigades shelling in al Israeli troops around Gaza City. There's also been fighting in Beit Hanun, the Hezbollah front, rem the Hezbollah front remains constant under constant attack, rockets, missiles. And then I haven't even got to Arya's, A-R-Y-J-E-A-Y, Arya's summary for today, March 25th. As we go down, sniper attacks on three Israeli soldiers in the vicinity of Al Shifa targeted a building housing special forces with an anti fortified uh, thermobaric grenade rocket, killing and wounding a number of its members in the vicinity of Al Shifa. Joint operation crushed Israeli forces penetrating the vicinity of Al Shifa with mortar shells, shelled Ashdod with a rocket barrage, separate operation altogether, targeted a Markava tank with a 105 Al Yassin 105. Uh, and this is not Al-Shifa, but here we completely destroyed a Merkava tank in the vicinity of Al-Shifa. Then there's fighting in Tufa, there's fighting in around Gaza City, but the Al-Quds Brigade, Saraya Al-Quds, same story, targeting, shelling infantry forces as they're holed up, uh, also shelling Ashkelon and Sederot. So, and the Hezbollah front remains completely active. So, major, major fighting and no sign of that letting up. As long as the Israelis are conducting this campaign of war crimes, crimes against humanity, atrocities on an unbelievable scale in Al-Shifa, the resistance is going to be hitting their snipers, hitting their armored vehicles, destroying their armored vehicles, and actually fighting a battle so and the israelis are so focused on and i don't know what's happening with their soldiers but imagine the command and control situation here they are giving their soldiers license to rape and murder and massacre in the hospital do these same soldiers even know that their comrades are being taken out by the resistance just in the outside in and around the hospital what what are they being told about the battle that's happening outside as they're committing massacres inside the hospital grounds. It's a really, I don't believe it's a sustainable situation. I don't believe it's a sustainable way to hold an army together organizationally. I don't believe the Israelis are going to be able to conduct a military operation like this for very long, for very much longer, certainly not indefinitely. There's got to be a morale collapse. There's got to be an organizational and discipline collapse. 
why would soldiers who are committing these kinds of atrocities then follow orders or have good discipline? It doesn't make any sense. So I don't see this. I don't see this going on. And I think th this is what I thought if they go into Rafa, if they go in and start just shooting people among the tents in Rafa, that the men who are ordered to go out and do that are going to, it's unclear what what's going to come back once you send men out to do that. But I mean, who knows? We have had uh, historical atrocities like the rape of Nanjing, which this is probably the closest thing that I can, this is the closest thing to that that I can think of. Um, I guess the Japanese did continue to fight after that, but uh, there is a reason why military discipline forbids the commission of these kinds of crimes. And I've said that before. And again, we don't, I don't know when this is going to, the consequences of this are going to be paid, but I'm confident that they are. Okay, what other fronts? Iraq, Iraq, the Islamic resistance in Iraq announced that they were targeting the Ministry of Defense of Israel, uh, March 23rd. Uh, probably they didn't hit it, but we don't know. Um, and, okay, the main story. The main story of the past couple days, I would say, well, it's hard to say. There are so many. But I let's just say this. I do not want to neglect the fact that there are massive armed resistance operations happening constantly in the West Bank. So today we had armed clashes in Balata camp in Nablus. We're talking about an ambush of Israeli forces in the camp's alleys. There was fighting in Balata camp since 2002, at least. I remember there was a whole theory of urban warfare that the Israelis were writing based on fighting in Balata camp. Um, there's been fighting in Tulkaram, fighting in Janine. There's been major, major operations in Janine, um, machine gun attacks. And um, and then bordering the West Bank, there were massive, massive protests uh, in Jordan today. And the Jor Jordan protests are really of a scale that is stunning. Um, and the, the chant, Abu Obeda once said that you, our people in Jordan, are the nightmare of the occupation that fears your movement. And they kind of answered the call today. They said, oh, Abu Obeda, we have answered. The people of Jordan are all with you. And so huge, huge demonstrations in Jordan and fighting out and out fighting, improvised explosive devices. I mean, the weaponry that's being used in the West Bank as well. I think John and I talked about this. It's such scale in the West Bank that it's also complicating. It's it's another front where the Israeli military is must remain fully engaged while they're trying to fight in Gaza, while they're trying to maintain a that massive presence on the border because they continue to have to worry about the possibility of a Lebanese Hezbollah invasion. Now, in terms of the West Bank, there's one other thing that I that I saw on the Middle East Observer website. Can't speak to the Middle East Observer's websites. Um, don't know much about it. I have been following it for a while. And they cite Walla Hebrew. Israel seizes a large cache of Iranian weapons smuggled into West Bank. It includes anti-tank missiles, RPG launchers, landmines, 50 handguns, 25 grenades. I don't know if you know these weapons. This doesn't look, for example, like the weapons that we saw at 
Al Shifa uh, when they were claiming that Al Shifa was a Hamas base. They didn't have this kind of layout. This these don't these could again. I don't have the expertise to tell whether these are even real or whether they're styrofoam and realistically painted. None of I can tell you none of this. I can't tell whether this is AI generated or CGI or anything. However, all I can say is this: if this is real, if this is a real shipment of weapons that was interdicted by Israel somehow, it's probably others that have come through. And so that means that the armament in the West Bank for fighting Israel is about to reach uh, an, a very upgraded uh, level, including some of the same kinds of weapons that the Palestinian resistance is using in Gaza. So who knows? Could be real, could be fake, um, but um, as they say in social media, big if true. Right. And, and, um, it's, yeah. Okay. Any, there are a couple of other things on the humanitarian front that should probably be mentioned. One being the United States passed a bill defunding the United Nations Refugee Works Agency, UNRWA, until 2025. And it's conditional on the Palestinian Authority not supporting any investigation by the International Criminal Court into war crimes committed by any Israeli nationals. So that's a funny one. Um, just, again, flushing any credibility or honest broker or anything like that that the United States may have tried to claim down the toilet completely. The United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur Francisca, Francesca Albanese, you've probably seen her apparent public appearances. She reported, I'll show you on Aldan Marquis' Twitter. Aldan Marquis is a great account to follow for Yemen news in particular. Aldan Marquis, the report concludes that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza has been met. So that also came out today, probably worth reading for the human rights inclined. And I just wanted to show you a report from the Electronic Intifada's, a tweet by the Electronic Intifada's Tamara Nassar, because she was criticizing uh, AOC AOC in particular said, the Israeli government has the right to go after Hamas. And Tamara asks, do they really? Actually, the Zionist death cult in Tel Aviv has no right to go after a single Palestinian resistance group or otherwise. Israel is a usurping colonial regime with no right to a single inch of historic Palestine. And that whole notion that Israel has the right to go and murder whoever they deem to be Hamas and the problem is they're not doing that in just the right way. That's only helping the genocide. That whole that whole rhetorical structure is a genocidal rhetorical structure, and there's nothing uh, nothing good that comes out of that, which is not surprising considering where it comes from. But that is. Um, it's yeah. It's just it, I, I, it's important that Tamara's critique be widely heard, um, and and that 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 rhetorical structure in particular just be debunked. And with that, I believe we can conclude our sit rep tonight. I think this is an extremely dim dynamic situation and it's just there are so many paths that things could take from here and we'll just have to see where the branches go and we'll follow them uh, here and you can 
you can follow them with me. Please like and subscribe, and we will see you on the next one.